Professional real estate investors are a different breed. We're not afraid to go all in and take educated risks to build stronger businesses and help our families live better lives. This is the Flip Nerd Professional Real Estate Investor Show, and I'm your host, Mike Hambright. Each week, I host a new episode live and bring you America's top real estate investors as guests. Let's start today's show. Hey, everybody. Excited to be here with you today. Uh, today, I am talking to Steve Richards, and we're talking about uh, something that we're both very passionate about, which is how to run and own a business, not a job. So many real estate investors end up in that J-O-B and they get stuck there and it's not a good place to be. That's what we're going to talk about today. Steve, welcome to the show. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, happy to see you. It's funny, we, we were talking uh, ahead of time here. In fact, we've been talking for like a half hour or so. That's honestly, I do all these podcasts. We've done over 1,500 podcasts over this last like almost seven years, coming up on seven years. For me, it's just, it's the ability to just kind of hang out with you and network. And, you know, we usually talk for a half hour ahead of time. We're talking afterwards and all this stuff. So it's, it's always fun, but you said some things and I even told you what you just said could have just as easily come out of my mouth. Right. Which is, you know, we, we, we think the same in regards to actually running a business. And it took a long time for me to get there because I was just in the weeds so far and making more money than ever. So it was kind of like, well, I'm working harder than I want to, but I'm making a lot of money. And then at some point you're just like, yeah, I just like, I don't want to make less money, but I'm, I got to get out of my own way. So I know you felt the same way, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's a trap. It's like the curse of successful business is now you're, now you find out that it actually yeah. the starts sucking out of you. you yeah. And, it, and the truth is, is it, it, it did, this it hasn't happened to me. I'm going to knock on some wood here, but it happens to a lot of people when something bad happens, right? They get sick, family member gets sick something happens where their time has to go somewhere else. It has to, it's not an option. And then the business suffers and then they're like, this isn't a business. This is a job. Right. Yeah. So, uh, so I think what we want to talk about today is to, to tell folks that let's be proactive about it. Let's, let's get to that point. So before it becomes an issue for you and we all, nobody got in this business of real estate investing to work, 80 hours a week and be trapped where they are. Right. So, uh, they did it to, to own a job, to not to own a job, to, uh, own a business, but, uh, yeah. that's not how it usually works out. So, Hey, before we kind of jump into this, tell us your background. You've got uh, a, a lot of, uh, great success, a lot of war wounds. I can see some scars on, on your knuckles there and stuff. So <laughs> tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So <clears throat> yeah, so much of this stuff, it's funny how it all, it, to your point, a lot of the experience and you just learn and we'll tell people, if you guys are watching this today and you're newer to the business or newer to business in general, a bunch of you guys are going to be like, yeah, you're, you're probably 25 and making more money twice as much as your parents ever made or three times as much together. And it doesn't really matter that you're working all the time kind of, and you're probably not going to listen to some of this. And then when you're old guys like us, like Mike and I, you're going to be like, oh man, those guys are right. But, um, you know, I've, I've got, I know my kids are older, mine are teenagers now. So I just have this different perspective on things, but, um, you know, <clears throat> the, my quick story is I, I came out of business school in mid nineties and then I started consulting in the tech world. And so my first clients were dot com clients. And I was like, Oh, I just thought you had to like sneeze onto a napkin with a business plan and someone gives you $5 million, <laughs> not, not to make a product, to make a prototype, to go do a dog and pony to try to raise you know, a hundred million dollars. And then everybody lies and just says how it's going to be a hundred million dollar company and in, in, in five years or whatever. And so it was just really, it was an interesting time to come out. There was also a lot of, uh, I worked for a big company called EDS. It was actually Ross Perot's and being in Texas, you know, not, not too far from, uh, where I live actually. Yeah. Like five, five miles. I lived in Plano for three months when I started there, um, yeah. by the guy pod, the, uh, Plano headquarters. Yeah. But, um, you know, getting out was interesting during that time because we had, we had clients that were crazy.com clients. And then we had the defense department was one of our clients, like literally, you know, the $10 million toilet seats that are probably paying for <laughs> <laughs> in other countries and stuff. There was all this like super extra secret, uh, secret, uh, like trying to get compliance and everything to be in the building. It was, it was kind of interesting, but, um, but it was a cool time because I learned so much, but I had this business degree that I didn't pay a lot of attention. You know, I was more into my fraternity and intramural sports and things like that. But I had these business law classes, accounting and strategy classes, and I didn't really pay a lot of attention. And that's now all I really care about. Um, 
but I had the foundation of business. And then I went out and I was consulting for companies who really didn't care. Like the government didn't listen to anything we said, like literally as a consultant for them, they just were, it was so bureaucratic. It was crazy. And then the startups would listen to everything we said, no matter how stupid it was, there was no oversight. It was like too totally weird. And I'm 25 and no, no one should have been listening to me anyway. But, um, but that was my entree into the business world. And so it was interesting. And I had a front row seat in 98, 99, 2000 for the dot com bust. And, um, you know, everybody found out you can't make money on the internet. At least that's what they thought until, you know, now Zuckerberg and everybody's come around Amazon, you know, Bezos, luckily they figured the internet out, but you know, that was crazy. And then on the back end of that, there was a lot of Y2K projects in that tech business where they thought all the computers were going to shut down when it turned, you know, 2000 and January yep. 1st, or whatever. And, um, you know, I, I went through all that. I didn't even realize it was a uh, recession then. I had no idea. And I just was getting kind of promoted up through the ranks and growing and doing different things. Um, you know, 9-11 kind of extended that recession a little longer. But when we came out of the back into that, I continued to grow in my in the business world, but I had gotten bit by the entrepreneurial bug like pretty early. Um, and so I would say by 2003, two or three, I was getting out of a startup that I got involved with and I really wanted to do something. Um, so for about a year, I was just kind of like try, thinking of all these different ideas. So I started reading a lot of different things that led me into stuff like Think and Grow Rich and Rich Dad Poor Dad. And yep. not, I don't have the story where Rich Dad Poor Dad turned me on to real estate or whatever. Actually, I was just a guy that I played pickup basketball with at the gym was like, my dad and I just got done. You might know some of these guys, Chris Kirshner. If you remember that guy, I know that uh, name. Yeah. He was a uh, sell houses on lightning. He was all subject to hmm. and um, Ron Legrand. And then we actually, the first, anyway, I met, so I met this guy and he's telling me, I'm like, yeah, man, I got to start a business. I'm sick of being in the corporate world. He's like, well, my dad and I just dropped 30 grand going to all these real estate courses. And we're dropping mail, but now my dad was going to retire and do this. And he's not doing it. So now I've got 30 grand invested in boot camps. We have three ring binders with CDs, by the way, back at that time. And um, he was. At least you didn't, didn't say uh, eight tracks. No, I know. I'm yeah. sure that, you know, that was probably back. I, I definitely remember uh, in my family, we had the, the uh, it was like cassette tapes. You opened up this big, like plastic binder and had like mm -hmm. six or eight cassette tapes. I had some of those too back in the day, but, um, yeah, Carlton sheets. Yep, absolutely. So anyway, kind of condensing that down, you know, he was sending out postcards, didn't know what to do. And I'm like, I don't know, man, I, worst case is we'll buy some rentals. He's like, we can get really good deals. I'm like, all right, I didn't even want to flip a house. I was like, I'll own some rentals. That's cool. But I'm going to start a business. And so my head was all around a business. And what's funny is I shifted and then I saw real estate. I'm like, Oh, well at the time this was 2004 when I got in, um, when I started and within that first year, I quit my corporate gig, which was pretty good. And I went full time in it because you could just fog a mirror. Like I just made 15 grand every time I bought a house. Yeah. You know, it would appraise for a hundred. I'd buy it for 80, you know, get a 90% loan on it. And I'd take, put 10 grand in my pocket and it, it'd be on a three, one arm with Washington mutual. And I, my pay, you know, my payment would be like all in was like 400 bucks a month or something crazy stupid, but it was on a adjustable rate mortgage. But and I was like, man, we could just, if I just buy one house a month, I can make six figures and then I'll flip a little on the side. And so I kind of got into this and it just literally to what we were talking about a minute ago to kind of preface that is all I want to do is start a business. And I ended up like literally jumping into a hustle. And then when I got in, I literally committed to the hustle because I'm like, oh, I can just hustle around and like trade my time for, you know, dollars and I'll just flip and chase money. And anyway, so, you know, I did, I, we ramped up to doing up to five rehabs a month that after that first year when I was full time and owning several rentals within a couple of years, we had 35, 40 rentals. And, um, that was about the time when we saw things slow down with the market. And so I shifted to do rent to owns instead of flipping to from bank owns to selling to homeowners that were going to live in the property, a traditional yep. flip we shifted to doing rent to owns. And then within a year that subprime blew up and then it was rent to rent. There was no two own <laughs> wasn't part of the deal anymore. And so we had two, two high basis in all these houses compared to the rents. You know, we had nice houses with fake 30 grand equity that we were going to get as a 30 grand pop on the back on all, all of them. But um, when we shifted to rent to um, own, we didn't really care about cash flow. We just cared about the equity. And I learned that rentals are a little different. So 
Um, during that time, we started focusing differently. And, and, and once I learned that, I started doing bus tours with some out-of-state RIAs and they started bringing people in and they're like, well, find deals for me like you find them. And so we got into, I guess, kind of wholesaling, but not, I didn't know what wholesaling was. Um, but I was just finding deals for them and they would buy them off me and deals I didn't, I kind of would rather make quick money on. And then they're like, well, if it was rehab, it'd be a lot nicer, you know, if I didn't have to rehab it. Well, you're already managing your rentals. Can you manage mine? And so like many turnkey operators, probably some people that are watching this, somehow it turned into, oh, I can make money on the rehab. I can make money on the sale. I'll make 10% of rents. It seems like all these revenue streams is what people talk themselves into, but it's such a slippery slope. And I literally have watched over the last, you know, 16 years, I've watched so many good people get destroyed on once either as a client or the actual person in the turnkey business. I'm sure you have too. It is, yeah. it is a, it's a tough, tough business. Yeah. And, um, I got heavy into that. I did uh, three, four, 500 of those. Like we did about 500 deals in a three or four year frame, time frame. Not all of them were turnkey, um, but they were all part of that. Um, but we really cut our teeth. We got a couple of re clients out of it. And then somehow I came up for air in 2013 and I'm like, man, we're managing 350 houses. We're doing 20 rehabs at a time. We're not really wholesaling as much as we used to. Um, one re client we made 600 offers for in uh, that year. And um, we got 110 houses maybe out of all those that were all MLS offers. We had a whole team of agents. Oh, wow. I mean, we had an office full of people. I had like 30 subs that worked for me in the construction. I had two different project managers that made like 50 grand a year salaries on top of like, it It was the most silly thing. And Mike, I'm a super deep visionary. If anybody watching this is an EOS kind of person, um, I'm not an integrator. And um, now I can pretend to be one in spurts because I understand what it means to my bottom line and my sanity, but- You have to, you have, to have that, yeah. Yeah, I just- um, it's crazy. I looked up one day, we had a construction company, a brokerage, property management company, investment company. I, I was running a RIA. You know, it was the first year we did seven figures in business. It was literally like the most miserable year of my life. And EOS Traction, I got introduced to that. Actually, at, um, I was at an Infusionsoft um, conference in 2013. And some girl there who her and her mom owned a bunch of um, Keller Williams franchises and she turned me onto the book and I started reading it and I couldn't get past the core values. I read the book like three times and then I made every one of my management team read it. And then we kept sitting down trying to do the first chapter of core values. And every time they're like, no, we don't like what you came up with. Here's what we think our clients would like. And I'm like, I hate all that stuff. And then one day at lunch, I finally was like, the only way I can see this is going to work is if we quit doing construction, quit managing houses. It's like the core tenant of what we did. And I, I, I set it out of frustration and they all looked at me like, oh yeah, right. And then I'm like, wait a minute. It's like, it's like the light bulb went off, you know? And I'm like, maybe we need to quit doing all that. And I had gone from being the strategic visionary guy that everybody wanted to come get information from. And they want to know about my strategy and what I think about the market and who I like and network with me and get to know me and all this stuff. And it turned into the only time I talked to clients anymore was hey, why are the reports late this month? Or my maintenance, I'm getting screwed on maintenance or this tenant left too early or your leasing is taking too long. It's like all oh, this horrible toilets, tenants, contractor, yep. this junk. And um, it was really hard. And so I hit a reset button in 2014. And that started um, at the end of 2014. I started a whole, like 2015 was a big transition year for me. It's really hard. Um, I, in fact, in 20, the second half of 2015 to the middle of 2016, during that year, I, I am positive. I spent more money than most people make on therapists, coaches, <laughs> counseling, uh, psychological tests. Like I had a trainer at the gym. I had a, a, um, a nurse practitioner. I was taking guitar lessons with one of my kids, golf lessons. I was like, I'm going to go do all this stuff. And I'm going to like re-engage. And I, and it was just interesting. Um, and I really kind of just reinvented I didn't even reinvent. I finally came back out of who I thought I wanted to be. And I really got to really know myself again. And, um, you know, coming out of that, we, we got heavy into wholesaling and we kind of screwed around with it. Um, this will resonate with some of you guys that are watching probably, but we, we paid Joe McCall and one of his buddies, Peter. Um, it was some stupid, like 15 grand to just set up our podio. I mean, it was literally, I remember my, my, 
the guy that I met that, that's now my business partner, Brian, who's, who's literally like my sole business mate um, integrator. I remember trying to convince him why we were going to wire them 15 grand. He's like, for what? He's like, I thought Podio was free. I'm like, yeah, but they set it up. I'm like, they set up your carrot website. And he's like, but that's 99 bucks a month. Like why? It was just funny, but you know, that commitment we made to spending money with somebody like that. Yeah. Um, much like why we use you as a disclaimer, I'm a client of Mike's everybody with investor machine is literally in spite of our own issues, we paid Joe's office a thousand bucks a month uh, to, to just throw mail out for us. Plus, plus the spend or whatever it was. And I think it was only like 750 postcards every, every two weeks. So it's 1500 postcards a month. That was all we sent. And so literally after 10 months of that, we would forget. We weren't using call rail back then. We used Vumber. I don't know if you ever used Vumber or remember Vumber. I haven't used it, but I'm familiar with it. Yeah. Like every couple of weeks, we'd be like, Hey, we better go look at that. And we'd go look at the leads and we'd be just like, no, no, hang up, hang up. Oh, here's a voicemail. And not very motivated. Hang up, hang up, voicemail. Not very motivated. We get like 20 calls in like, oh, here's one where they said they got to sell tomorrow. Let's call him back. And so some of you guys are probably laughing watching this, but like, I know you do that in your business. And if you don't, your lead manager does and your acquisition guy does, but you're just totally sand. We were sandbagging, but in, in that, in that year, um, actually, so it was 2016 was when we did this. We spent 10 grand on marketing that that year basically. And we did 229,000 revenue, like screwing around. Like I was selling off houses still and, and my business partner was flipping some houses and we were just kind of like loosely partnering on this like wholesale thing. And we were like, gosh, I mean, what if we did that full time, you know? And of course we thought that it would all just magnificently like quadruple and all that kind of stuff. But, um, that was the beginning of it, man, at that point. But I was bound to build things differently and also know who I am yep. and then have the right people around me. But you know, we went on from there to um, build a team. The next, the, so we went in to build it right. But the, the next big learning lesson for me was we built a team really, really poorly that next year. And we had to dismantle all that at the end of 2017 and, and um well, middle of 2017 to start to rebuild using cognitive testing and personality testing. And, you know, we've talked about this. One of the businesses I own is it helps people do that kind of stuff, but, but, but literally hiring the right people makes all the difference in the world. No doubt. So we started using vendors in 2016. I got my head straight about what I really wanted in life, which is probably the number one thing most people have wrong. We started using vendors to do the things we needed to support our business. Then we started hiring the right internal people and then like in 2017, it kind of, it's not all been roses, but it started to click. And so um, we've been able to run this business now and we, have, we do flips and wholesales and we're in the Indianapolis market. I spend a couple hours a week in it, probably sometimes not even that much. I mean, one of the, our dispositions guy is the direct report of mine and we do a weekly call at noon on Wednesdays. And like, sometimes that's the only time it's like an open live coaching call for people. Sometimes that's the only time he gets to talk to me. So he'll be asking me, Hey, Hey, can you uh, look at your email or something on that call in front of everybody else? Cause he like, he just can't even, I don't even put time into it. So um, anyway, I got super long winded there, but I, but I wanted to take that chance, Mike, to start to talk about some of the pivot points too. So it's been a weird road for the last 20 years for me, but um, look, there's some component, I'm sorry, I just gonna say there's some components we've learned that aren't even about real estate. It's literally about business and so my current heart is, is just helping people understand how to run a business instead of own a job, which is what you started out by saying. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about that for a moment. So now like, you know, it's, it's easy to look back over 10 years, 15 years, a long time and say, well, now with what I know, I could have figured that out in like six months. Right. But th that's hindsight. Right. So what the, the key is, is, and what I hope people, some people that are listening probably have gone through this as well. You get to a point to where you, you either, you know, die like proverbially, like from, well, hopefully not literally, but proverbially from like, I, this isn't for me. I just need to go get a job or work for somebody else or whatever. If your goal is to be an entrepreneur and, um, and have your own business, like hopefully you get to a point where you learn how to do it better, just like you did. I, I have a lot of experiences like that too. But for those that are earlier in their career and not kind of where you want to be yet, and you feel like you're in a job, like maybe let's take a couple minutes and talk about like yeah. how to jump that learning curve because 
you can do that by surrounding yourself with people that have been through that before. And, and basically just, it's a quantum leap forward, right? It's like, I don't have to go through all those things. I don't have to touch the hot stove to learn. I shouldn't touch a hot stove. It's like, no, let me just tell you, don't touch a hot stove. <laughs> right. And so, uh, but some people, some people are stubborn and they just have to learn. Like our, my son is 13 and my wife talks about it all the time. He's, you know, he like stuck his finger a while back in, uh, you know, it's just, it's, they're not like cigarette lighters in your car anymore. It was just like a power jack, but apparently you can still get burned from sticking your finger in there. Cause that's why I saw She's like that. He has to learn. He has to smell his own burning flesh before he, I told him not to do it. And he did it anyway. And it's like, that's just how he is. He just has to experience it to learn what not to do, which some people are like that. I'm probably like that in some regards, but you know, if you surround yourself with the right people, or if you listen to people that have been through this before um, you can jump forward and let's talk about that a bit. How can folks, what are some of the kind of key lessons that you've learned about treating what you do like a business um, and not getting stuck in a job? Because so many, most get stuck in a job at best. Might be a, if they do well, maybe they're a high paid, they have a high paid job, but it's still a job, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I could talk on this for years, so I'll try to keep it concise, but I do have to start with something funny that I have twin boys and they're uh, 14, so about the same age as your son. But um, I remember getting kind of annoyed at my wife being so diligent about wanting all those plug covers in the plate. You know what I mean? When yeah, the kids yeah. childproof things. Yeah, yeah. I remember telling her one time, like, those are so stupid. Once the kids get a little older, but like when they're toddlers and run around, I'm like, you, ha you would have to have some small little metal object that could shove inside of it at least like half an inch to actually get shocked. I'm like, it's so dumb. And then one day, somehow, one of my boys found some metal thing and had it shoved <laughs> in there and shorted out of. I mean, it was incredible. I was like, it will never happen. But anyway, <laughs> you have teenage boys, like, when they're young, anything will happen. Yeah. By the way, you know, I think, Mike, to answer your question, um, so I, I'll, I, there's, four, there's four pieces. And so one of the businesses that you, you and I are talking about, you know, one of the places where I spend, um, the business I spend the most time in, which is maybe five to 10 hours a week, is the CEO Nation. And it, it, we have a, this four pillar model in there. And so I'll kind of answer it that way to keep myself on track or else I'll talk for an hour again. But um, I'm going to go in reverse order because we teach them in a certain order because I think they're easier to implement. But here I'm going to go in order of importance, starting with the most important, is the alignment in the business is personal alignment, like having the business set up to give you what you want. But here's the problem. I don't think setting the business up to give you what you want is the hard part. I think most people fail at it, um, but it's actually pretty easy. It's not simple. It's, I'm sorry, it's pretty simple, but it's not very easy. But actually the hard part of that is the other side of the equation of setting the business up to know what you want, to give you what you want. It's actually knowing what you want. I, if we do this thing, um, if you're keeping score at home, you guys can do this exercise. We won't have time to do it on here, but in our, when we do mastermind events or different live events, there's a couple of things we do that are really cool. So one of them is the four questions and it's more powerful if I took time, but I'll just run through them. So it's, what do you want? What are you doing to get it? How's that working for you? And what are you going to do next? And when you ask them slowly and meticulously and be like, pick one area of your life, what do you want? Most people have, don't even know what they want. A lot of what they want is, and I'll just share this with you guys, especially um, if if you're young, it's hard to have a lot of perspective. I'm not slamming anybody who's not married with kids yet, but you get a lot of world perspective once you have kids and you get married and then other people's lives. Like I've got two dogs, a cat, three teenage kids and a wife. And literally they will all die if I don't do my part to take care of them. I guess I could probably die and they wouldn't die, but you know what I mean? Like <laughs> they might thrive, you know, sometimes <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you like to believe that they would, uh, yeah, suffer, they might be like, pretty Ooh. sure they couldn't get out. That but, uh, no, but when they're babies, right? Like you got to take care of them. It's so funny. You just get this different perspective. But my point is you get a lot, you get a lot of what, what you, when you're forced with these decisions about marriage and, and kids and life and owning a business for years and taxes and all, all of a sudden you start to really care differently about life. And you're like, Oh, I have an opinion on things. I didn't think I used to care about. So it's hard when you're young. It's also hard when you get stuck in a rut, which a lot of us have, which is like, go to school, get a job, put, pay your dues, work, you know, work hard, get promoted, you know, whatever, um, jump jobs, but only do it every year and a half. Cause it doesn't look as bad or whatever it is, but you get stuck in this rut 
And then it's like, this is the best way I can explain it. When you go to a superhero movie, you don't sit there the whole time and get pissed because, well, Superman's flying and people can't fly. So I don't want to watch this movie because that's not real. Like you suspend reality when you're watching a movie, but we don't do that when we dream anymore, when we get old, especially when you have kids and a family and a corporate job, you start thinking about what moves you could logically make. Well, I make 150 grand a year salary plus benefits. So you start thinking how much I got to hit that exact number, right? Like you just, or my wife, because of this or, or my husband, like I need to be here for this or I couldn't work weekends or I, whatever it is, but you, you get caught in like the expectations of the people around you right? And, and what you think you're good at, what you don't think you're good at. And so you don't dream openly anymore with being detached from reality. So one, one big segment of people in business that are younger don't have a lot of life perspective to really know what matters to them yet because they just don't, I mean, and it's fine. But they don't know what's possible just, yet. Yeah. And they don't know what they care about or they haven't got to know themselves. Um, and another set of people that get older that find entrepreneurship later in life are kind of already stuck in a rut. And so they, they start formulating their, their, they have blinds, massive blind spots, like, or got our blinders on. Right. And um, those two things suck for helping you dream to create a business that will give you what you want. And what it really sucks for is deciding what you want. And so that was the biggest epiphany for me. And the other ones all fall into place after that. I mean, once you really know what you want, when you're honest with yourself about what you want, then you just have to know, well, how much money and time do I need to do that stuff? And it's yeah. not like I want to make a million bucks. If I want to make a million bucks, what am I going to use it for? Where, where are my kids going to go to school? Where do I vacation? How many homes do I, what kind of car do I drive? How much do I give to my church? Um, how much time do I work out? What do I eat? Like getting really clear about what you want out of life is the number one thing. And then after that, you said some key lessons and they fall into place where it's like, okay, well, what business model can give me that? And then after that, there's business is business. Like, like you said, I, I just pay, co I mean, I don't have to figure anything out anymore. I can pay somebody, I can pay a coach or I can hire an operator or I can pay for a training or whatever. Like the tech part of it is what so many people I'm sure in coaching, because you're so much, you've done so much more coaching than me. I can't imagine how many times you've been asked all these technical questions. Like people think they need to learn how to wrap a subject to deal and do a double closing and they want to know all that stuff. And that's not really their problem. Right. And right. so I just think that's the big setup is knowing what you want. And then after that, going out and finding a business model that can give that to you. I mean, those are the two big pieces that everybody misses because they get inserted right in behind the business model and they just start doing deals. Right. They didn't really pick the model, you know, and they didn't pick the model because they knew what they wanted. They just got inserted and they started making money, like you said, and they're just like throwing money off. And now they're like stuck in the middle of something. Yeah. There's a couple things. I think people, especially if you left corporate America, you're, you're used to being in this employee mindset. Like I, I, I work right. And I don't, so I don't know how to not work. Cause I just, that's, that's, I like to work. I'm a hard worker. I have, you know, work ethic from my family that, um, has carried me a long way, but it's hard for me to do nothing, but I, which I, I don't ever do because I can't do it. Can't do it. Um, but uh, I think you, when you have that employee mindset, like sometimes people are like, well, I can hire somebody to do my, first off, we either think, well, nobody else could do my job, mm -hmm. which is not true for anybody, like literally any, not in real estate. Um, Cause you're not as good as you think you are. Uh, and two, by, by the way, you don't want, you don't want that to be the case. Like, you want to be able to hire somebody to replace you and take you out. Right. And so, or people say, well, when I, when I'm, when my business starts to do better, I can afford it. Right. And it's like, well, what if you can't afford not to do it? Right. So one of the things that's interesting about, um, been David Richter is in our investor fuel group and been spending some time with him talking about the profit first model. Cause he's, he's actually kind of licensed profit first for, and he's right book for yeah. Yeah, I saw and, that. uh, and you know, uh, it's just this idea of, well, how much are you worth? Like, what should you pay yourself? And start to think about what that seat is worth. Not you. What is the seat worth? What's the role worth? Because once you develop that role, it's like, okay, well, that's, that job pays 60000 a year or whatever. It's like, okay. But, and then you're going to find out that you're sitting in a seat half the time that's like a $10 an hour job. It's like, okay, I need to replace myself there because I'm worth more than that. And even the $60,000 job or 80, whatever, whatever it is, like, 
find a way to do enough business to offset that because that's, that's what you do as a business owner. You're not, that's how you get out of the employee kind of rut, right? Mm -hmm. Start to think of, I kind of advise people there here, start to think about every job in your company, every seat, whether it's an admin or acquisitions manager, disposition manager, lead generator, whatever it is, lead manager, like what, what does that job pay? And what job, what seats are you sitting in? And how do you get yourself out of those seats? Because, you know, you should believe in your mind that you're way too expensive for any of those seats. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. Working on your business versus in it is no joke. I mean, yeah. there's a reason to work in it. Hustle and grind is not a business model or a strategy. But if it's done correctly, it's, it's part of mastering your business and innovating and creating best practices. And then you do that to study it and master it and be able to hand it off and know how long it takes and know what, can, what the, the, the leading activity metrics are. And you understand right. as you, but you don't do it just to get done and make money, but you do it so that you're making money while you're learning it. So you can train somebody, right? There's a means to an end there. So yeah, yep. you're right. Like, yep. Yep. Um, well, let's talk real fast about, um, you know, sometimes we build a team to do stuff. Sometimes we bring in vendors or we outsource stuff to sometimes it's virtual assistants, sometimes it's call centers, lead generation stuff. There's a number of way, ways that you can, you know, if it's, not, this is how kind of how I think about it. If it's not a full-time job for somebody in your business, or even if it is like, I know for a lot of people that I hire, I'm like, we could figure that out, but we're going to be playing catch up with somebody that does that professionally forever. Like if that's all they do, we're never going to be as good as them. So why not just hire them? <laughs> Absolutely. And so, but just talk about, uh, you know, how you think about what parts to outsource versus what parts to kind of build internally. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I put some notes here too. I want to, I'll answer your question, but I want to circle, cause I know we don't have a ton of time. I want to circle back to something on, on employees. I think we'll tie in really well. Um, but here's the key, like, think of it this way. I like to think in analogies. I think this will help people. So when we, when, well, this, this is what predicates it. So when we did the turnkey business all the time, guys would be like, well, I just want to buy the house off you and then I'm going to manage it. And I'd be like, okay, why do you want to manage it? I already know it's because they think they're going to save 10%. Right. They think they're going to save money. And they're like, oh, it's because I want to learn. I want to kind of get my feet wet. I want to understand. And I'm like, all right, if that's really your philosophy, like literally the only reason you would ever do that is because you want to become a property management company. Like that's literally like, going to back to school for five years to get an accounting degree and then sitting for the CPA exam and passing it just so that you know what the accountant's going to do when he does your taxes. Like that is dumb. Nobody would do that. <laughs> so to your point, I mean, one of the reasons we hire several vendors in, I mean, just like you got, for instance, you guys with an investor machine, I, I can buy list source stuff dirt cheap. I can skip trace probably at a very similar point, <laughs> dirt cheap. We, we have spent years accumulating all this access to do things and it is a freaking nightmare to deal with it. And then one of the things I said about Joe McCall when they were doing our mail and what, what, it, what I love about you guys now, all these years later, we look at it as a, um, we plugged you guys into a need. When I did it with Joe all those years later, I didn't know what I was doing, but like we would get busy with our lives and no matter what, all of a sudden we'd be like, ting, 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 oh, mail hit because like all of a sudden we're getting all these notifications. So in spite of our busy schedules, like we still had leads. And that's a big key, you guys, with, with these vendor relationships and things, whether it's like building a website or, or like with Investor Machine with you guys, the way we use you guys for that, or um, just we do several things with title. And there's other pieces of components where just to do all that, just like that property management example, people think I'm saving 10% but there's two real costs. One of them is a physical cost of spending your time doing stuff. Yeah. And secondly, there's a huge opportunity cost, not only of spending your time not doing something else, but there's an opportunity cost of sucking at property management. That's right. Compared to property manager and your vacancies are twice as long and your maintenance projects go out of hand and you don't know how to proactively look around the corners because you haven't done it right. And you don't get economies of scale like with printing with, with, with mailers or whether it's your property manager that's doing mowing yards cause they're mowing 400 of them. It's, you know, it's just crazy that people are constantly tripping over dollars to pick up pennies in the business. And we're kind of wired that way as real estate investors, we think we're getting a deal, but just because something's the cheapest or we're in control of it, it absolutely doesn't, it, it, it's not part of owning a business. If you're a street hustler and you want to get the best deal, cool. 
but my dad used to like drive halfway across the city to fill his gas tank up because it was like three cents cheaper. And I'm like, right. I'm Bunch quite positive. Yeah. I'm like quite positive. That's not worth your time. Yeah. But you know, what's funny is, uh, and I, I'm still, you know, when you're a real estate, you're always kind of frugal, right? I, I've always been a cheap ass. So, but, uh, I'm getting better. What I'll say now is I appreciate like services and stuff that's like going to save my time. I used to like for many, many years, I w- if I was going to buy something online, I always like sort and usually it's sorted by like price lowest to highest or whatever. And so now there's a whole bunch of stuff that I, the first thing I do is filter what's the highest price thing. It's weird, but it's like, I, I'm trying to buy my time back. Like I don't, if it's yeah. time related or I don't, I don't really buy a lot of like junk. I mean, I buy some junk. My, my wife says every day is Christmas for me because I get an Amazon package, <laughs> but it's usually like mosquito spray. I'm just like buying stuff. And it's not like I'm like, buying myself gifts every day. I'm buying stuff that we think we need and I save my time from going to the store. But I often look at like, what's the highest price thing? And it's not that I always buy that, but I'm like, I want what's the best. I don't want it to break. If it's a service, like tell me what the best is because I'm trying to buy my time back. Yeah. And so not everybody's in that position and I'm not saying that to brag because I'm not talking about, you know, I'm not looking at like the most expensive cars like necessarily, right? Uh, but I just value quality, like product and time uh, over anything else right now, you know? Yeah, I'm that way too. I mean, I just, you know, I overlap the user ratings or consumer ratings and the highest price. So I do the highest priced ones in the consumer ratings and I look for the highest rated, highest price one. Like the the balance is there, you know? But it's funny, I don't don't have fancy watches, like not wearing a t-shirt. I haven't worn worn a watch in... 15 year. I mean, it's, yeah, I don't, it's, I don't, it's, it's right here on my phone. Like, why do I need that? <laughs> exactly. But, but I'm the same way as you. Like if I go anywhere and I can VIP or upgrade or like, I mean, when I go to the airport, I just, I always valet park because it's an extra hundred bucks if I'm gone for three or four days to like literally have my car dropped off at the door that I walk in and it's running for me, either warm or cool yeah. when I get into it. But like, you know, that's convenience is a big deal. And that's, but, but, but getting back to something that we were talking about to drive this point home, I think is that when you really understand what you want and you and I have decided that having crap that breaks, that's cheap. Like I'm exactly the same way you are. Like I get pissed when my wife will buy stuff and it's always like, she's like, I was trying to save money. And I'm like, but now we don't have whatever it is. Cause it broke or it wore out or I would have much rather got something that was nicer. But, um, Hey, I want to say, I, I know I'm probably breaking the flow a little bit. We're probably short on time, but I think this would be super helpful for your people. If I can, can I throw three things in really quick? Let's do it. Okay. So we were covering something that I wrote notes down. Like while you were talking, I was like feverishly, because you really reminded me of something important. When people are hiring somebody, there should be a return on investment. That's with a vendor or a person. And so when you're bringing a vendor on, you would look at don't look at it as an expense. This is something we, I wrote it down when we were talking pre-show too, right? But I want you guys to think about this um, because it goes for vendors or employees. And I think this is, there's three reasons that what we found with the CEO nation, you know, the research and the stuff we've done is what people get limited, why they don't outsource stuff and why they don't hire people. Um, Number one is they don't, they think it's an expense, but it's really an investment. And typically you're going to get a three to five X return on a good employee or a good vendor. I don't have time to break that down because I know we're trying to stay on time. Just realize the money you put in should have a three to five X bottom line effect into your business over the coming months or it could take a year sometimes. It just depends on what it is. Um, but, but even if you hire a $30,000 a year admin, I mean, that person should be freeing up somebody who frees up somebody who frees up your sales guy that goes out and does a hundred grand more business you know, should that three X is, is, is legit. And we've seen it time in and time out is what you should be looking for. Um, another thing is just think about it this way. If you don't think someone's as good as you, like you can, you can do your mail the better than anyone in the world or whatever. You have a screw loose first of all, but, um, or you can do acquisitions better than anybody. So even if you're 120% good, like you're hundred percent is great. You're 120% at that activity, but you're doing five things at any given time. Right. Yeah. Um, let's call it six things for easy math. You're 120% good, but you only do it 20% of your time. That's effectively, if I make up my Steve math, that's 24% effectiveness. Cause I did, it's 20% of time, 120% good. But if I found someone who an employer and a vendor is even only 80% good, 
but they do it a hundred percent of their time. I mean, I've literally got like a triple that's that three times X, like literally they're 80% effective because they're 80% as good, but they're a hundred percent of their time. Right. And so that's how that comes into play. So they don't have to be as good as you. Yeah. Right. And the second, and the third thing, um, people don't think they can afford somebody else, but if you bring someone on, especially like an employee, like hiring a 30,000 or $36,000 a year girl or gal to work in your office is three grand a month. It's not $36,000 check. Right. And just like when you hire a vendor, if you're going to pay five, 10 grand to 20 grand a month for a vendor, some of our marketing vendors are expensive. Um, our VAs or people we look at like that. Right. But they have an immediate return on the bottom line. And so all we have to do is afford what we call the runway. So like when you hire someone, you just have to know when the break even point of that person that starts to produce. Usually going to take about a month to find them, about a month to get them in trained and about a month to ramp up. So about 90 days, they should be paying for themselves by effect on your bottom line. Same with a vendor. It's not overnight. So you can't bring someone on for a month and quit or hire someone and fire them two months later. But I know I want to, I know we're running on time there. I wanted to say those, Mike, because I just think if, if we wanted to leave people with really important stuff on how to own a business instead of a job, I think thinking that things are expenses, thinking nobody's as good as me and thinking I can't afford things are literally three of the worst, like cancerous thoughts that you can have in your head. And it's, they're so normal for people to have, especially when you're entrepreneurial and you're smart, yeah. nobody knows what I know and nobody works as hard as me. And they're just all lies that we tell themselves and they're not even lies. It's just, we don't have the right perspective. So anyway, I'm off my soapbox. No, you're good. You're good. Hey buddy, I know you're, you, you, you've got to run here shortly and we've been going at this for a while. So we could probably talk all day about this stuff, but real mm -hmm. fast, if folks wanted to connect with you, um, you've got a number of things going on. You've got your own podcast now. Where, where do they go to kind of connect? I want to be able to share some links. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, so just on Steve Richards on Facebook, um, that's a great way to connect with me. Just DM me if you want to chat. But um, the CEO Nation. So our podcast is um, iTunes or Stitcher, wherever you listen, the CEO Nation. Um, we have a Facebook group, the CEO Nation, and um, the CEO Nation.com. It's um, anywhere around there is where I'm, my heart is there. The team architect company that we have that helps people with teams kind of filters through there, our real estate business. We do some coaching. We do all kinds of different things, but everything for me filters through trying to create impact for entrepreneurs. And it all starts with the CEO nation. So awesome. I just appreciate you having me on. It's been cool. Yeah, and absolutely. Love I was on your show you. here fairly recently. I think you just published that one. So, uh, um, you and your twin. <laughs> yeah. This is it Dave? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, yeah. Uh, my VA put, put That's Mike's name wrong. Inside Post joke there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I've been called, I always say I've been called worse. So yeah. Um, no cool, man. Well, Hey, appreciate you spending some time with us. We'll add mm -hmm. links for a bunch of these things down below in the show notes here for those of you, uh, by the way, we're, I can say we're, we're recording the show live. Of course we record every show live. We're actually broadcasting live when we recorded this in uh, our Facebook group, which is called the professional real estate investor network long name. But if you go to flipnerd.com slash professional, we'll redirect you there. So we're shooting about one show a week. This is a professional real estate investor show. Uh, on average, about one show a week live in the group. And uh, if you join the group, we'll notify you when the shows are coming up and you can join live. We can do a little Q&A when we have time. So go to flipper.com slash professional to uh, join our group and, uh, and learn more. And it's, it's, it's not a huge group. It's we're never going to be a group of tens of thousands of people because, uh, again, professional, as the name sounds, is not uh, newbies. We love newbies. If you're new, that's great. We were all new once too. But there's a lot of other groups to service you guys and not a lot that really focus on professional folks that are doing a lot of volume and have a lot of questions. So, um, Steve, thanks again for joining us today. Great to see you, my friend. Yeah. I just want to, in closing, say that the reason why I'm here for any show you do or asked you to be on my podcast or connect, you know, this Facebook group, I'm excited for it to grow because everything you do is top notch, brother. I appreciate everything you do and anyone thanks listening to it should check out anything Mike's doing because, um, I think very highly of you and what you've done. So I appreciate it. I appreciate everything. that, man. I appreciate that. It means a lot. Sometimes you wonder what when you're doing podcasts, I feel like, is anybody listening? Right. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I appreciate those kind of words and everybody we've been at this for a long time. This jazzes me up just to get to spend time with friends and bring you uh, folks that can share some, some great insights and knowledge and wisdom in some instances for sure. So you can check out all of our podcasts on flipnerd.com. And again, go to uh, flipnerd.com slash professional to join our professional real estate investor group. So everybody have a great day. We'll see you on the next show.
Thanks for joining me on today's episode. There are three ways I help successful real estate investors take their businesses and their lives to the next level. First, if you're in search of a community of successful real estate investors that help one another take their businesses to the next level and a life-changing community of lifelong friends, please learn more about my Investor Fuel Real Estate Mastermind by visiting InvestorFuel.com. If you'd like a cutting edge solution for the very best done for you lead generation on the planet, where we're handling the lead generation for many of America's top real estate investors, please learn more at theinvestormachine.com. And lastly, if you're interested in a free online community of professional real estate investors that isn't full of spam, solicitations, and newbie questions, please join my free professional real estate investor Facebook group by visiting flipner.com slash professional.